In this video I'll be going through my notes on level 2 mechanics. A link to the PDF is in the video description, as is a list of corrections. Scalars and Vectors A vector is a quantity with both size and direction. A scalar only has size, no direction. Examples of scalars include pressure, temperature, time, mass and energy. Now time is one that you could possibly argue, but at this level of study we assume it to be a scalar. Examples of vectors include displacement, velocity, acceleration, force and torque. Basic motion. Displacement is position change, we measure it in units of meters, and the scalar version without direction is called distance. And so if I was going to go from A to B, and I went there and then I went back. If the distance between them was 20 meters, the distance that I would have traveled would be 40 meters there and back. However, with knowledge of direction, we can recognize that overall my position hasn't changed since I'm back where I started, and therefore my displacement would be zero. Velocity is rate of displacement change. We measure it in units of meters per second, which we can write as meters divided by seconds, or equivalently ms minus one. Our scalar version is called speed, and the equation we can use to describe it is that the velocity is equal to the displacement divided by the duration over which the displacement occurred. Acceleration is the rate of velocity change. We measure it in units of meters per second per second, and we write it as ms minus two. As an equation, we can write that the acceleration is equal to the velocity divided by the duration. Graphs of motion. Here we're going to look at two types of graph. First of all, a distance time graph. A distance time graph has distance on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. A flat line means that the distance isn't changing over time, therefore a flat line means stationary. A straight line means that the distance is increasing at a constant rate, therefore a straight line means a constant velocity. A curved line means that the rate that distance is changing is also changing, therefore a curved line means acceleration. For a distance time graph, slope is velocity. So the steeper the slope, the higher the velocity. If our slope is zero, then our velocity is also zero. And if we have a negative slope, we have a negative velocity. Let's now look at velocity time graphs. These have velocity on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. A flat line means that our velocity is not changing over time. Therefore, a flat line means a constant velocity. A straight line means that our velocity is changing at a fixed rate, meaning that a straight line is constant acceleration. We could go further and look at the case of changing acceleration, but this would take us outside the scope of the course. On a velocity time graph, the area underneath is distance, and the slope is acceleration. And so the higher the slope, the higher the acceleration, which is zero if our slope is zero, and negative for a negative slope. Since the area underneath the graph is distance, we could calculate the area to find a distance of 55 meters has been traveled. Kinematic equations. Kinematic equations are used to describe the motion of objects with a constant acceleration, including zero. They contain a mix of the following values. VI is our initial velocity, VF for final velocity, D for distance, a for acceleration, and T for time. And so here are our four kinematic equations. Important to note, each of these is missing one of our aforementioned values. You can use this information to help narrow down which equation needs to be used. Drawing vectors. Vectors have two properties. Magnitude, which is indicated by their length. The longer the vector, the higher the magnitude and direction, which is indicated by their orientation. We can describe direction in many different ways. We could say left or right. We could give direction as an angle. We could specify north, south, east or west, and also up or down. Scaling vectors. To scale a vector, meaning to affect its size, we multiply it by a scalar. So if we have our vector v, we can multiply it by a half to get half that length. 
multiply it by 2 to get double that length, and multiply by 1.5 to get 1.5 of that length. Multiplying a vector by a negative causes it to point in the opposite direction. So negative v is going to point in the opposite direction, and we can scale it at the same time. Equating vectors. Like scalars, we can form equations with vectors. We can use the following techniques. First of all, circles are zeros, where vectors forming closed paths equal zero. So if we have a vector a, and then we add on a vector b, add on a vector c, and then finally a vector d, we see that all of these vectors form a closed path, and that that path leads us back to where we started, so that the sum of all these vectors is just zero, back to where we started. In our second example, we have our vector a, b, and c, which form a closed path and therefore also must equal zero. No matter which order you add them and how many vectors you use, a closed path of vectors is always going to equal zero. Equivalent paths. A vector or set of vectors that start and finish in the same place are equal. So if we have our a plus b, and that we can also get to this same destination with just a single vector c, our a plus b, must equal our c. Furthermore, if we have our a plus b, and we can also reach that same destination with c plus d, then a plus b must equal c plus d. Finally, we have our a plus b plus c, which puts us at the same destination as just d. Therefore, a plus b plus c must also equal d. Trigonometry refresher. In this course, we'll extensively be using trigonometry, so on this page we're going to briefly go over the basics. Fortunately, every triangle that we will be applying mathematics to in this course is going to end up to be a right angled triangle, which makes the mathematics a lot easier. Our longest side is our hypotenuse, and our other two sides depend on where the angle is. If we define the angle as being here, then our adjacent side is adjacent to that angle, and our opposite side is opposite the angle. If I define the angle to instead be here, then our adjacent and our opposite would be the other way around. Pythagoras gives us the equation that the hypotenuse squared is equal to the opposite squared plus the adjacent squared. With a bit of rearranging, we can solve this for each side. Sokotoa is a way of remembering the three trigonometric ratios. So is that the sine of the angle is equal to the opposite over hypotenuse. Ka is that the cosine of the angle is the adjacent over hypotenuse. And Toa is that tan of the angle is equal to the opposite over adjacent. Vector components. It is often useful to separate a vector into horizontal and vertical components. Knowing the total magnitude and the angle, we can use Sokotoa. So for our vector where the magnitude is v, and our angle to the horizontal is theta, we have our horizontal component and our vertical component, and also a right angle between them. We're able to use our Sokotoa because this is a right angled triangle. If we're going to use our ka relationship, that tells us that cosine of the angle is equal to our adjacent, which is our v horizontal, divided by our hypotenuse, which is v. Multiplying both sides by v and swapping the sides around, we end up with this equation here. For our v vertical, we can use the so relationship, where sine of our angle is equal to our opposite, which is our v vertical, divided by our hypotenuse v. Once again, multiplying both sides by v and swapping them around, we end up with this equation here. Relative velocity. Velocity is always relative to something. We generally define velocities relative to the ground, as this usually makes the most sense. However, it is often useful to break from this convention. When dealing with relative velocities, there are two rules we need to remember. Firstly, that opposing velocities add. So if we have two vehicles traveling towards each other, one with a velocity of 5 and the other with a velocity of 7 relative to the ground, because they're opposing, our velocities add, and they're moving at 12 meters per second relative to each other. Same direction velocities subtract. If our two cars were moving at velocities in the same direction of 5 meters per second and 7 meters per second relative to the ground, then these same direction velocities will subtract, giving us 2 meters per second relative to each other. 
Here we see a truck moving at a particular velocity, carrying a cannon, which fires a ball with an equal and opposite velocity to the truck. These two velocities cancel out, and the ball is momentarily stationary before falling to the ground. Look at that. Fantastic. I mean, look, it, it doesn't move at all. It's going straight down. Gravitational acceleration. Objects on Earth accelerate downwards due to gravity 9.8 meters per second per second, which gives us a gravitational acceleration of 9.8 meters per second per second, where our unit of meters per second per second is just a simplified form of meters per second per second. Gravitational acceleration is unaffected by the mass of the object. So that whether or not we have a bunch of bananas, or a much more massive truck, both are going to accelerate due to gravity at 9.8 meters per second per second. However, on Earth, air resistance causes objects to accelerate slower than this, as do other forces such as the buoyancy force. Considering a feather, the force of air resistance is significant compared to its gravitational force, therefore it's going to accelerate much slower. For a hammer, however, because of its large mass, the force of air resistance is much less compared to its force of gravity, therefore its downwards acceleration is only affected by a small amount. Here we see a bowling ball and feathers released to fall at the same time. As you might expect, the bowling ball falls faster due to the friction of the air having a much greater effect on the feathers. Pumping out the air and repeating the experiment, we see the ball and the feathers accelerate identically, proving that gravity accelerates all objects at the same rate. In this simulation of positioned balls of helium, glass, rubber and stone above the ground. Upon release we see the glass, rubber and stone fall at different rates. This happens because the force from the air friction affects them in proportion to their different masses. Because our ball of helium is less dense than the air around it, the buoyancy force exceeds its force of gravity. As a result, it accelerates upwards. Repeating the experiment but removing the air, without the force of buoyancy and the force of air friction, all four materials accelerate downwards at the same rate. Projectile motion. An object in projectile motion has both horizontal and vertical motion. So considering the flight of a tennis ball, we have our blue vertical velocity upwards, which due to the downwards gravitational acceleration decreases as it descends until it reaches the peak of its motion where the vertical velocity is zero, after which the velocity increases but in a downwards direction. To simplify the mathematics, we assume that there is no air resistance, that the only force acting in flight is gravity, and that the gravitational force is uniform and downwards, that means that our horizontal velocity must not change, because there is no influence to change it. So to summarize, for our horizontal motion, there is no acceleration, meaning that we have a constant velocity, which we can describe with v equals d over t. For our vertical motion, we have an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second per second downwards, resulting in a constantly changing velocity, which we can describe with our kinematic equations. This model, put together by the European Space Agency, visualizes the relative strengths of gravity across the surface of the Earth. Blue regions are low, red and yellow are high. The deviations observed are caused by a number of known and potentially unknown factors, including the difference in composition of the Earth. It's important to understand that when we give a value for the acceleration due to gravity, such as 9.81 meters per second per second, this value is very much an estimate. Force. A force is an influence that acts to accelerate objects. We measure it in newtons. The specific nature of forces is described by Newton's laws of motion. Newton's first law states that an object will only change its motion, or in other words its velocity, if a force acts upon it. 
Newton's second law states that when a force acts upon an object, it will accelerate proportional to its mass. We can describe this with our equation force equals mass times acceleration. Newton's third law states that forces exist in equal and opposite pairs. You may also have heard the interpretation that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. I have here an RC helicopter and three things I'd like you to try to explain. How does it go up and down? How does it go back and forwards? And how does it rotate? Here's some footage of it flying to help you think. Now for the explanations. To move up and down, the helicopter spins its main rotor, which is shaped to apply a downwards force to the air. In return, the air applies an equal and opposite force to the rotors. If this force is greater than the force of gravity, the net force will be upwards, and the helicopter will accelerate up. If the force is equal, there will be no net force, and the helicopter will remain at the same altitude. If the force is less than the force of gravity, the net force will be downwards, and the helicopter will accelerate downwards. To move forwards and back, the helicopter spins its back rotor. If the rotor forces air upwards, it will experience a downwards force, which will tilt the helicopter backwards, giving our main rotor force a backwards component, which will accelerate our helicopter backwards. If the back rotor blows air downwards, it will experience a force upwards, tilting the helicopter forwards, giving the force on the main rotors a forwards component, and accelerating the helicopter forwards. The helicopter is able to rotate using its two main rotors. These spin in opposite directions, and if they spin at equal velocities, they will apply equal and opposite torques to the helicopter. In this case, the torques cancel out and there's no net torque on the helicopter, but if one of these rotors is slowed, the torques will no longer equal, and the helicopter will experience a net torque, causing it to rotate. Here we see two Finnish astronauts sitting on top of a car that is accelerating towards a concrete barrier. The car is stopped as it experiences a force from the barrier. Since our astronauts do not experience this force, and objects in motion will remain in motion unless acted upon by a force, they continue with their original Ford's motion. I have here a zero gravity air floater, a name that makes for good marketing, but not good physics. What's really going on, as you've probably deduced, is that a flow of air upwards, producing an upwards force on the ball, is counteracting the downwards force of gravity, which we can regard as more or less constant, and certainly at no point zero. You might wonder, why does the ball stay within the column of air, even when it moves back and forth? This happens because our moving column of air is at a lower pressure than the surrounding stationary air. This is due to Bernoulli's principle, which is not assessed within this course. The surrounding high pressure regions produce a restoring force on the ball, directing it more or less towards the centre. Here we see a valiant hero leading the charge to free a stranded pickup truck. Performing a vector analysis, we see the man applying three forwards forces on the truck, however these are only made possible by an equal and opposite force backwards. The net force applied to our truck by our valiant hero is therefore zero, and our man's efforts are unfortunately in vain. Hooke's Law Hooke's law describes the force produced when a particular material is deformed. It states that the force applied to and by a spring is equal to negative the spring's stiffness, which we measure in newtons per meter, multiplied by the displacement of the spring from equilibrium. Important to note, the negative indicates that the force and the extension are opposed to each other, so the direction in which we extend the spring or compress the spring is going to be opposite to the force produced. 
The stiffness describes the newtons of force a material exerts for every meter of displacement. The graph to the right shows the relationship between force and displacement. So we have our force on the y-axis and our x on the x-axis. On this graph, the slope is the stiffness k. So if we start to apply a force and displace our object, in this first section, the material undergoes elastic deformation, meaning that the material returns to its original shape after being deformed. In the second section, plastic deformation begins to permanently change the material's shape. And so we see that our slope begins to change, which is indicating that the stiffness of our object is changing, which indicates a deformation of that object's properties. Deformed beyond this, the material breaks. Circular motion. We describe objects in circular motion using the following terms. So we have our object, our bowling ball, which is undergoing circular motion at a radius r, which is half the circle's width. We can also define our circumference, which is 2 pi r, which is the length of one lap. A revolution is a term for a complete lap. The period t is the seconds per revolution, whereas the frequency is the revolutions per second. As I've tried to indicate with the language, these two are reciprocals of each other, so that frequency is 1 over period, and period is 1 over frequency. The velocity of our object can be considered to be distance over time, as always, where the distance for one revolution is 2 pi r, and the time for one revolution is just our period t. Centripetal acceleration as an object changes direction, its velocity changes, even if the size of the velocity does not. So because velocity is a vector, changing the velocity can be done by either changing the magnitude, or in this case, changing the direction. The object has therefore accelerated. We call this centripetal acceleration, and the force causing it the centripetal force. This is not a force itself, but rather a role played by others, such as tension, friction, gravity, etc. The centripetal acceleration always points to the center, as does the centripetal force. So if we consider our object at two points in time, which is undergoing circular motion, our centripetal acceleration is always pointing towards the center, whereas the velocity is always tangential, or in other words, 90 degrees to the acceleration, as we see it is here. Our centripetal force can be defined as mass times our centripetal acceleration, since force is mass times acceleration. This is also equal to the mass times of velocity squared divided by the radius. Torque. Recall that a force is an influence that acts to accelerate an object. Similarly, a torque is an influence that acts to angularly accelerate an object. It has units of newton meters. So if we imagine a wrench, and we're exerting a force at a particular distance, we're going to have some torque produced, the magnitude of which we can describe with the equation that torque is equal to the force multiplied by this distance. Equilibrium. An object in mechanical equilibrium experiences no changes in its motion, linear or rotational. For mechanical equilibrium to occur, the sum of all the forces and the sum of all the torques must equal zero, which we can also write in fancy mathematics. Note that an object in equilibrium need not be at rest. For systems with multiple pivots, such as this one here, any pivot can be used for analysis. Note that any torque produced at r equals zero will be zero. What I mean is that if we selected this as our pivot, we would have a torque produced by this support here. However, the torque produced by the support here, because it's r is equal to zero, because we have defined our pivot as here, it will also have a torque of zero and will therefore cancel out of any equation. Center of mass. The center of mass of a set of objects is the weighted average position of their masses. If two objects are balanced about a pivot, the point at which they balance is their center of mass. So the center of mass of two identical objects is going to be halfway between them. Whereas if we substitute one of our Earths with a Jupiter, as the mass of Jupiter is much larger than Earth's mass, the center of mass is much nearer to Jupiter. 
I have here a glass, two forks, and a matchstick. Balancing these just right, and spending an embarrassing amount of time doing it, we see what initially appears to be counterintuitive. All the weight is on the end of the matchstick, so why doesn't the matchstick topple? If we consider where the match is pivoting and draw a line through it, what we see is that we have a roughly equal amount of mass on either side of our line, meaning that our match fork structure has its center of mass above this pivot, and since their combined force of gravity acts from this point, it has a distance of zero. As the distance to our pivot is zero, no torque is produced. Energy Energy describes the potential for an object to change its motion. We measure energy using units of joules. Energy comes in many forms. In this course, we will consider the following. Kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion, described by the equation EK, is equal to half times the mass times the velocity squared. Gravitational potential, which is energy stored in a gravity field, described by the equation EG, equals the mass times the gravitational acceleration times the height. Elastic potential is the energy stored against elasticity, described by the equation EP, equals half times the stiffness times the displacement squared. Conservation of energy. Energy is never created or destroyed, only transferred into different forms. We call this conservation of energy. We could imagine 10 joules of electrical energy being converted into 3 joules of light and 7 joules of heat. The total energy hasn't changed, only the forms that it's in. We could also imagine 35 joules of gravitational potential energy being converted into 2 joules of air resistance and 33 joules of kinetic energy. Finally, we could have 100 joules of chemical energy converted into 10 joules of light and 90 joules of heat. Work. Work describes the energy used to perform some action. It is effectively another word for energy. It therefore has the same units of joules. The work performed when applying a force over a particular distance so here we see a force being applied to a mass on a spring over a particular distance is given by the equation that the work is equal to the force times distance. Power. Power describes the rate at which energy is consumed. It is measured in joules per second, which are commonly called watts. We can describe it with the equation that our power is equal to our energy divided by the duration over which it's consumed. Examples include a 25 watt stereo consuming 25 joules every second. 25 joules divided by 1 second is 25 joules per second, or in other words, 25 watts. A 10 watt fan consumes 10 joules every second, since 10 joules divided by 1 second is 10 joules per second, or in other words, 10 watts. Momentum. Whereas we've previously used velocity to describe the amount of motion an object has, this doesn't take into account the mass of the object. For this, we use momentum, which has the units of kg meters per second. As an equation, our momentum is equal to our mass times velocity. We could determine the momentum of a bee with a mass of 0.01 kilograms and a velocity of 10 meters per second to be 0.01 kg meters per second. We could also consider the momentum of a car traveling at the same velocity, but with a much larger mass. Because of its larger mass, we have a much larger momentum. Impulse. The longer a collision takes, the smaller the force. This phenomenon is called impulse. As an equation, our force is equal to the change in momentum divided by the duration over which it changed. Consider a force time graph. A large force over a short duration would look something like this. Whereas on another graph, we could represent a small force over a long duration as something like this. The area underneath both graphs is roughly the same, therefore we have the same change in momentum. If you consider a car moving with a particular momentum, we could imagine stopping it suddenly by slamming on the brakes, or gently applying the brakes and coming to a slow stop. Conservation of Momentum If there is no unbalanced external force, momentum is always conserved. In other words, the total momentum before will equal the total momentum afterwards. 
For example, before, if we consider a orange ball with a momentum of 20, and a green ball with a momentum of negative 30, negative because it's in the opposite direction, our 20 plus our negative 30 give us negative 10. After they've collided, we could imagine our orange ball with a momentum of negative 25, and our green with a momentum of 15. Negative 25 plus 15 gives us negative 10. Our momentum before and after is the same, therefore momentum has been conserved. Here we see a man mixing Mentos and Coke to manufacture a rocket. The reaction expels gas and fluid out the bottom. Via conservation of momentum, the downwards momentum that the fluid leaves with provides the bottle with an equal and opposite upwards momentum. As simple as this may be, the physics behind this is the same physics that gets us to the moon. 